Hello, and welcome to Catholicism in the Car. My name is Parker Zerbo. I want to continue talking about arguments for and against the papacy. Now, the papacy is the defining doctrine of Catholicism. I'm not, I don't mean it's the most important doctrine. Clearly, those are the doctrines of Christ and the doctrines of the Godhead, the Trinity. But it is the most defining doctrine. Catholicism has many, many things in common with both Protestant Christians, Orthodox and Orthodox Christians. Um, But what it does not have in common with either of them, the least common denominator, you could say, is the papacy. Now, many Orthodox will go so far to say that uh, Peter does have primacy. He is first among equals. Uh, Rome was the uh, first established church and does have the highest order in priority. Some will even go so far to say that Peter does have um, a a type of jurisdictional overship, overseeing of the church. They just don't think it's a universal universal jurisdiction. Um, That's kind of as close as you can get in orthodoxy without becoming either Eastern Catholic or Roman Catholic. Protestants, on the other hand, In my understanding, the closest they will get is to acknowledging that Peter himself had primacy and even jurisdictional authority, even universal jurisdictional authority. But generally, unless they are Anglicans, they will will not say that 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 authority was passed on through apostolic succession. Now, I have a quick aside here. I have a lot of trouble understanding how Protestants get over the hurdle that both branches of Christianity, for really as long as Christianity can remember, have taught apostolic succession. This has to go with a lot of Protestant doctrines where they claim that Catholics and Orthodox are wrong. Um, The thing is that, I mean, sure, you can take your, your scriptural evidence, but scripture's been interpreted by Catholics and Orthodox for, for 2,000 years. Really, like, I mean, and if I'm being most generous, at, at least, I would say 1,800 years, 1,800 years. Um, virtually any Protestant I've met who is well-versed in history will say that you see a clear formation of, uh, of the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church structures by the late 200s. And really, I mean, these just these seem like historical facts unless you're going to throw away the history or dream up some sort of scenario where uh, where the church was your particular understanding until that time in the late 200s and the church has just been either a remnant in people's hearts or it or the church did fall and was only resurrected when your denomination's understanding was 
resurrected or begun. I just... I mean, I get it. I get it on the one hand. I get it on the one hand. But I, I really don't on the other. Um, the, thing, the way that I can understand it is I can understand with certain principles how it seems that interpreting Scripture from uh, Scripture alone, from your own personal authority, I see how that's attractive and I see how that um, can make sense within a certain paradigm. What I don't see is historical evidence for this. I also don't see scriptural evidence for this. Um, and I really think, this is a bold claim, but I really think it is rooted, this idea of personal interpretation of scripture, is rooted in an anti-Semitic view. Now let me clarify this. It is clear that Martin Luther and also other reformers were clearly, clearly anti-Semitic. Um, now, I'm not trying to say that there weren't Catholics who were anti-Semitic. There certainly were. This was the 1500s here, 16th century. Uh, Anti-Semitism was a thing. I think an argument can be made that the Jews did not and do not interpret scripture on a personal level. Never have, never will. They have scripture and they have tradition. And most Protestants will acknowledge that they also have scripture and they have tradition. The problem is with Protestantism, where does your tradition lead back to? The thing about tradition is it has to have roots. It has to have lineage. If it only leads back to 1517, or maybe if you're going a little earlier to the early 1400s, Jan Hus, uh, John Wycliffe, those people. But other than that, except for maybe with the Waldensians, um, and the, oh, what was that other group, the Albigensians, I mean, there, there's some pretty big gaps in uh, a group of people thinking similarly to what, to what, you know, let's say evangelical Protestants do today. Now, I do think Lutheranism as a whole, minus Sola Scriptura. Luther as a whole, so speaking mostly about Sola Fide. I think Sola Fide does have some sort of precedent. And it, it seems to go back to Augustine and others. Um, Sola Fide does have a precedent. But the thing is, is that people like Augustine have been wrong on many things. So what, do we just pick out Augustine and we say, well, just because Augustine thought this, you know, and even the consensus of the fathers, why, what indication do we have that Christianity is a democracy of ideas, of ideals? God has always set up his kingdom from the beginning with a head and with an authoritarian, author, author, um, and with a authority structure. Why, why would we expect that to change? Jesus came to save us from our sins. Uh, he, nowhere that I can recall in the New Testament does Jesus talk about a total reversal of the ecclesial system. There are parallels all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament that there is a there is a um, that there is a high priest. There are 
there is a type of Sanhedrin. There is an authority, authority structure within Ju Judaism. And there, I mean, why would we think that that would stop with Christianity? Except for if we're reacting to the authority structure that was already in place in Christianity.